or is it Munda? Necromunda, Necromunda, I don't know, but I'm currently waist deep into a narrative campaign for this game, and I'm loving every second of it. In today's video, I'm gonna show you how my gang is shaping up currently, and how we're gonna polish off the rest of these little criminals with some painting and conversion. No one is safe. I cannot wait. Let's go! Say hello to Jedediah, or as he's known in my group, Jedi D, baby! This is my gang's word keeper, their leader, and he's the one mighty and strong. Born upon this godforsaken planet to bring the Emperor's kingdom to Necromunda for all those weary and in need. You might ask if I'm riffing on the Church of Latter-day Saints, and the answer would be yes. Unapologetically, yes. <laughs> I've kitted him out with a great sword and smoke grenades, and he just runs at people and murders them, and he's been doing a phenomenal job at that. Sadly, he doesn't actually have a great sword, but we're gonna fix that today. Next, we have my champion, Barabbas, wielding a heavy crossbow. This disciple of Jedediah salts the earth with holy fire, reducing unbelievers to ash. <laughs> Next, we have the grunts of the gang, the brethren. Verlin, Malachi, Ezekiel, and Solomon. Solomon isn't quite done just yet, but most of them have the wrong weapons. The best weapon in Cawdor's arsenal is called a polearm with purgation shot, which is basically a flamethrower attached to a stick with a knife taped to it, in true Garbage King style. Conveniently, not a single one of that weapon comes in the basic Cawdor kit, so we're gonna be slicing up some finished paint jobs to make sure my faithful boys are looking fresh and accurately kitted for their next battle. Lastly, we have the lowest rung of human life on Necromunda, the Cawdor Juveniles, or Bone Pickers as they're referred to. Lazarus isn't quite done yet, but Abraham is finished, and boy did I spend far too much time on him to justify the near instantaneous death he's gonna experience the moment he encounters a stiff breeze. The life of a Cawdor Juve is, uh, not nice. I also have Absalom and Elijah, another brethren and bone picker, respectively, in need of a full paint job so you guys can see my process and a special addition to the group that'll make more sense later. All right, now that you've been introduced, let's get started on all the conversions that I've been so excited for. Verlin, Malachi, and Ezekiel all have the wrong weapon, and we're gonna fix that today. With a collection of bits from my own horde and also a few bits from another participant in the campaign, I begin my violent crimes against my painted models. First, I chopped off the musket-looking barrel on the front and glued on the front half of a Skatari flamer part. I used sprue goo, a combination of plastic and plastic glue, to get a sludge that will help fill any gaps. I also smoothed out the squeeze out from the sprue glue with plain old super thin plastic cement. I know I glued it on upside down, but I felt like the valve thing on top helped to layer the conversion better with the existing kit. I then took the longer gas tank from that same part and glued it onto the mini in a suitable area. With the glue dry, I then took some string from a fabric store and wound it around the gas tank. There's a lot of rope elements across the whole Cotto range, and the design language is basically sci-fi garbage men, so this detail seems to fit nicely even in the 41st millennia. Superglue applied with a decommissioned airbrush needle is helpful to get glue right where you need it. Then, with some aluminum wire and amazing kit bashing material, I bend a cable into place. This kind of thing just takes a bit of time, removing it and putting it back in place and making sure all your bends are kind of in the right place and at the right angle. I've linked all the stuff I use for these models in the description below, and those are affiliate links, so I'll get some extra money at no expense to you. Expense? There's no GN expense. That's a great way to support the channel while also getting stuff you need for the hobby. Treat yourself to my aluminum wire recommendations. <laughs> With some hollow styrene rod, I cut a very short piece and opened the ring up so that I could slip it over the existing model and this newly added cable. Again, layering elements with the existing kit helps meld the two better, and it also hides some of my bad cable bending work. In an effort to hide the pristine nature of this Katari bit, I carve it up a little bit with my X-Acto knife, adding some weathering. This definitely should have been done before I glued the part on. Lastly, I glue on some scale model mesh to make it feel more appropriate for the destitute world of Necromunda. Munda, Munda, Munda! I did something similar to Malachi and Ezekiel, which will finish up the conversion work on these three boys. Before moving on to the next conversion, let's hear a brief word from this video sponsor, which is me. Fresh to the web store are six new Wood Elf models, the Ranger, the Warrior, and the Witch. 
They come in both 75 millimeter scale, like the Duchess miniature, but also 32 millimeter, a first for me, just in time for the old world and Wood Elves making a excellent comeback. These are evil Wood Elves. Booted out of the nice part of the forest to scratch a living off of moss and shrooms, and they are not happy about it. I'm super pleased with how these characters turned out and how they mesh together so well. Along with these new models are three new masterclass courses that walk you through how to paint the box arts as well as share a ton of helpful information. Ben's class focuses on the science of light, shadow, and color theory and approaches miniature painting in an incredibly unique way compared to the other courses on the site. I learned so much from simply editing this course, let alone painting along with him. John's class on The Warrior is aimed at beginners to large-scale painting and focuses on having fun and not drowning you in information. My class on The Ranger focuses on drowning you in information. <laughs> Seriously, if you're a skeptic like me and want to know justifications for every little choice, this course is for you. There's also a ton of information about crafting unique schemes for your miniatures and picking techniques that make sense, and it's all self-contained. All the info you need to paint the model is found in the course itself, so no jumping around for additional context. I'm very proud of these three new courses. They're not simply a walkthrough of the paint job, but rather an educational experience. You can check out free previews of each course to try before you buy if you want. Lastly, also new to the web store is a sexy metal brush coffin for your hobby tool transportation needs. There are two foam trays, one for brushes and another for more brushes plus extraneous hobby tools. It comes in black and red and any mixture of those two finished with an embossed Miniac logo on top. Now was also a great time to pick up some merch on the web store that is heavily discounted as it's going out of stock to make room for new designs. So if you want some of these items, get them while you can. Actually, lastly, if you are an employee of a game store or you own and run a game store and you want to stock some of my product in your store to sell, get in contact with me. You can find my email in the about section of my YouTube channel. I would love to have my stuff more widely available throughout the world to make it easier to get. That's it for now, now back to Necromunda. Painted this Word Keeper model over five years ago, and I didn't really know anything about Necromunda then, so I just kitted him with whatever the assembly instructions recommended. But today, we're gonna hack him up, and no, not with clippers. With an X-Acto knife, I tried my best to carefully slice off his two hands, and it was pretty simple, apart from his entire right arm also coming off. Oops. The head was thankfully easy to snap off. Why, however, am I cannibalizing not only this perfectly fine paint job, but the past ones as well? I have this awesome sniper rifle bit that fits this model's pose perfectly, which is great because my gang has a champion with a long rifle, and I still don't have a model to represent that. I would never be the kind of person to revisit a model, even to change the paint job, let alone carve the model up, and I'll explain later why I'm suddenly okay doing this. With the head socket blackened out and the rim of his coif cleaned up, I glued in a painted head that I finished up at a Necro Sunday paint jam I attended recently. I think the goggles will look great with rifle, evoking a Spec Ops vibe. <laughs> yes. As Spec Ops has caught or can be, at least. Cutting this mini up, however, begs the question of who will be the new Jetty D. A while back, Vince Venturella bought me the Headsman, the House Cawdor Executioner. Not only was it a super meaningful gift at the time, but I genuinely love the concept of this model. But in the game of Necromunda, he's really expensive and doesn't stick around once purchased. And I want this guy to see the battlefield whenever and wherever I'm liberating souls. With some conversion work, I bet this model will make a great word keeper for my gang. He comes with an ax, you know, he's the Headsman after all, so I have to fix that. Benadiah is kitted out with a great sword as aforementioned. My first thought for a weapon was a sword from the Night Haunt range for Age of Sigmar because they're suitably rusted out and evil looking. It has the wrong hand, however, so step one is to clip out the headsman's hand and don't worry, I'm definitely holding on to this sweet ax bit for the future. With the hands removed from both weapons, I can begin drilling holes into the guard, either side of the hand, and the handle of the weapon. Because the handle is so small, I drilled an extra small hole and used guitar string as my pinning material. With a couple parts glued and dry fit together, I was feeling pretty happy with the direction that this was going. To take this conversion to the next level, I grabbed the whetstone sharpening bit from the Underworld's Night Haunt kit for his right hand. Sadly, I couldn't get the cool chain to work, so I had to remove that part. 
With a generic Kato arm, I began the process of staring at, positioning, removing, filing, more staring, cutting, and more to get his hand and arm in the right place so the angle of the whetstone matched the bell of the blade, and it looked mostly natural. I wasn't afraid to super glue the arm parts together to check the fit. The key is to use a tiny amount so it snaps apart nicely, and then with a little bit of cleanup, it's like the glue is never really there. Fiddling with poster tack with something like this isn't worth my time. Obviously, you wouldn't sharpen a weapon like this as it'd be too heavy to hold with one hand, let alone the weight of a whetstone pressing down on it, but it looks too awesomely menacing to not do. To polish off this conversion, I took a bit of green stuff and with the aid of silicone brushes and the grease on my Gamer 5 head, I filled and smoothed some gaps in his hands and arms. This was a super satisfying conversion to do and I'm so happy with how it came together. I like it so much more than the previous Jedediah. Now, let's fling some paints on these zealots. Let's begin some more simple, finishing up what will be a new champion for my gang. I start by painting the gun a dark silver and applying a matte black wash to kill the shine as I plan to weather this up. My first weathering step is to sponge on a brighter layer of silver to break up all of the flat surfaces with a grainy metallic finish. Now onto the rusting. I've done rust a few different ways on my gang, and for this rifle, I'm gonna try something new. I mixed up some dry pigment and water. In this case, mostly water, as I wanted to act like a wash. I then applied it to the rifle, let it dry, and with a damp sponge and brush, began to wipe away most of it, leaving behind a dark brown effect in the recesses. Kinda like an enamel wash, but no mineral spirits required. I did the same thing again, but more selectively and with a rust red pigment, and I was pretty happy with the overall result. But at this time, I'm not really sure if it's better than my other attempts or necessarily easier or faster. With the rust effect complete, I applied a minimal layer of bright silver highlights just dotting the edges. This step makes the sculpted details easier to see and thus appreciate, same as a wash would. Then with a mixture of Tamiya clear red and a little bit of black paint, I sponge some gore onto his makeshift bayonet. More taped on knives, I love it. Now, the face I painted does not match his visible skin, so I'll have to repaint those elements, which I did with a more Mediterranean palette. Kind of a yellowish olive skin tone. I painted the original head with some borrowed Monument Hobbies Pro Acryl because I keep hearing about how everyone loves this stuff and I wanted to give it another go. The closest color matches that I had on hand were from Reaper MSP. Say hello to Ervil, my gang's new champion and sniper. I think it turned out pretty good, but let me know if you guys can tell that the arms and hands were painted with a different range than the face. In the meantime, I polished off another ganger at home. Say hello to Solomon. His weapon came from a Cotor upgrade sprue, so I didn't have to kit bash it. Imagine having to worry about your candle going out on your flamethrower while running around on the field of battle. So bad, it's good, like an Italian sci-fi movie. <laughs> All right, let's paint the rest of the crew. I don't really have this scheme figured out quite yet, so these steps may feel a little weird and inefficient, but here goes nothing. I begin with a dark brown base coat after a layer of primer. Combining these steps into one with a colored primer would be a good idea. Next, I apply several layers of a zenithal undercoat of green, and I'm letting the overspray get everywhere. My painting recently has been very experimental, so I've not stuck to one green recipe for this gang, and it turned out all right. I painted some with two thin coats, TT Combat, Scale 75, Vallejo Game Color, and more, and the colors I'm using today is this random assortment. The further along with the airbrush highlights I get, the more accurate and intentional I become. With the final green highlight, I also make sure to airbrush some of the strapping on the legs, as this will eventually have a Vallejo Express paint applied to it, severely darkening it down. So I want it to be brighter now. Speaking of that, I went a little bit too bright with the final highlight, a product of me trying out these new paints and not knowing what's gonna happen. To adjust this, I take some lime green ink and apply it to the highlights to bring the color back and reduce the brightness. This ink is semi-translucent as shown here, meaning that I'll be able to get some color without obscuring too much of the current airbrush blend. In a perfect world, you just nail the brightness and color right away, not needing to do this correction. With the green looking absolutely lush, I move on to the khaki. My scheme is trying to be considerate of using the airbrush as long as possible, which is why the top and bottom of the model is split into two colors. This allows me to work on the top half first and then the bottom half without fear of getting too much overspray. 
After my base coat and initial highlight, I do some shading with a sepia colored ink to bring some contrast to the khaki. And that will finish up the airbrushing. With a good foundation, I start the paintbrush work with a lot of base coats. The ropes and stitching get a yellow brown base coat. The leather and other various elements get a dark, rich brown layer of paint. The metal gets a coat of silver paint, and all that strapping gets painted with Black Lotus, a Vallejo Express paint that was previously mentioned. If you get the undercoat brightness just right, this paint produces a great cold black that needs pretty much one layer of height to create a convincing effect. With all that squared away, it's time for a big step. But first, an example. I've been trying to tame the beast that is oil washes during this project. When I apply the product, it looks like magic. And then five seconds later, the surfactant in the wash is so strong that it pulls itself out of the recesses and spreads and looks pretty awful. I learned to trust the process and put a timer on for one hour, let the wash set up. As you likely know, it takes a super long time for oil paints to cure. We're talking over 24 hours or more. After that one hour, I then take a dry makeup sponge and wiped away the extra wash that spread out and looked all nasty and got a really nice effect. I'm not using any mineral spirits in this sponge. The wash doesn't stick around in the shallow details like the texture of the rope, but in between the rope and cloth and other various layers of fabric, it does, and it looks pretty great. Oh, also, I finished this guy you're seeing here at home as well. Lazarus here is ready to crush some unbelievers with his faith, which is also coincidentally the name of his flail. Jumping back to our work in progress gangers, I wanted to try something new with this oil wash. Everyone got a glossy undercoat first and then an oil wash to see how much that helped with the application of the wash and also the cleanup. I wash everything, including the weapons. It gives them a head start on weathering to have a nice grungy brown wash. After giving it an hour to cook, I removed it just like before, and unsurprisingly, you get a much cleaner effect with the gloss varnish. I actually kind of like using a more matte base coat for an oil wash because when you remove it, the paint gets caught in all the microscopic bumps and ridges and creates more of a feathered transition and less of a stark line. Neither is a wrong approach, but just different results. After all the washing, I applied a heavily diluted layer of matte varnish. Varnish, much like normal paint, is less opaque when you thin it out. For this application, that means that it won't be dead matte immediately, so I can sneak up on the finish that I want after a few layers from the airbrush. Back to the brush. I'll start where we began with the airbrush, which is the green coif. It's always hard to match the color you achieved with the airbrush exactly, especially considering we used that ink to fix a mistake. The good news here is that you don't really need it to be exact, and it shouldn't be. I use a color that looks similar and it's also, more importantly, slightly brighter, but not by much. It needs to be fairly diluted to not upset the creamy blends of the airbrush. When in doubt, go slow and be delicate with this step, especially on the softly defined volumes like on their shoulders. On details that are sharper, like the folds of the coif around the neck, you can be a little bit more aggressive as those volumes on the model are smaller and need less blending. For example, the little bumps on the rope are so tiny and well-defined that I don't really care about the exact color I ended up with or blending anything. If I grab an ochre-ish color and paint each little bump, that'll be good enough. I do the same process for the volumes of the khaki fabric, which is a little bit easier because khaki is such a desaturated color that it's pretty easy to match the hue, especially if you're starting with the same paints you used while airbrushing. All you have to worry about is getting a little bit lighter. For the brown, the process is more traditional because it's flatly base coated. I step on a highlight color that I mix with a Caucasian skin tone. I like to mix brown highlights with a color like this or an ochre. The stippling gives leather a nice worn feel, which seems appropriate for these guys. I could probably go a little bit harder on the weathering, honestly, especially on the khaki that would collect dirt like none other. As someone who lives with two black animals, white clothing is not allowed. <laughs> For my leader, I did some special little writing on the parchment with a thin black paint and then did a checkered pattern on his epically long scarf. I started by plotting out the pattern and filling in every other square, and then just went back and forth endlessly with brown and cream, trying to make each individual square as neat as possible. Next up, I work on the skin, which starts with a base coat followed by two highlights. I try to sneak some skin tone in between the straps as that helps to break up all the black, but this can get a little bit challenging. 
there isn't a ton of visible flesh on these guys. It's mostly hands and the odd arm or two. The black is pretty simple because of the considerations we made when painting the undercoat of the straps in a color that wasn't really that bright. A single edge highlight hastily applied on a few of the fabric pieces and I'm done. It's time for some more rust experimentation. Dirty Down gets a lot of praise, but it can often look a little too intense for my needs, and it also doesn't collect very nicely in the recesses because of how viscous it is. What if we just mix it with water in a 50-50 ratio? Because the mixture is way thinner, it gets into all the nooks and crannies way better, and then it dries and still looks magnificently rusty. Better yet, you can take a damp brush to remove some of the surface rust if you want to, leaving the crustiest stuff behind. Another way to get a great head start on rusting metal is to wash the silver in an acrylic brown or sepia wash, which is what I did on the other three gangers we converted earlier in the video. With the rusting complete, I sponge on some more silver paint and paint a few edges here and there with a bright silver, just like we did with Erval. For the candles, I do a ghostly seafoam color that I work up to an off-white green. Green is an important part of my scheme, and so far, only one part of the model has green. So painting additional parts, even if they're small and a different kind of green, helps to contextualize this color in my scheme, making it feel like it belongs more. It's not a big deal to paint one candle like this, but it took a bit longer to finish Jedediah 2.0. For the wicks, I paint them in pure white first, and then I try to blend a fluorescent hot pink color toward the tip of the flame as it should be brightest and hottest right at the wick. This is often kind of hard to get right, so some futzing is required. Time to paint that big sword. I start with a base coat of Molotow Chrome, a marker ink that is super shiny. You have to heavily base coat with this to get a nice shiny effect. You can't apply it thinly. If you do, it often looks like any other metallic paint. It's way easier to use this through an airbrush for what it's worth, but that isn't really an option in this case. With the blade looking sharp, I paint some black brown into the pitting and add a bit more to the sword that wasn't there. I think I probably could have added a lot more weathering to this sword. Inside these brown spots, I paint in a gradation of orange to appear as rust, but the rest of the sword is staying nice and brilliant. Obviously, Jetty D meticulously cares for this sword as he believes it's an embodiment of the Emperor's will, and so far, the Emperor's will is to slay all the non-believers. Maybe it's a little tacky, but I like the ultra chrome effect. Makes him stand out in this horde of a gang. That and the 15 pounds of candle wax on his shoulders. As a last ditch effort to sneak some more green into the scheme, I wash various accent parts of the weapons with Quelia green shade, which also breaks up the silver parts really nicely. Lastly, let's paint some bases. And luckily it's super simple. With a silver base coat applied, I flood the base with dirty down rust. And once it's dried, I wipe 90% of it off of the surface with a damp brush. This creates a lovely varied effect once dry. I sponge on some more silver highlights for some variety. I pick out the little domed lights with white and then later hot pink like they're glowing. And lastly, a nice clean black base rim. And that will finish off my gang for Necromunda. I'm not totally sure why, but I've been loving this game. I'm unsure because on paper, the rule set is everything that I dislike about GW games times 10. The rules are spread out across multiple rule books. There are endless exceptions later throughout the rule set, making it very difficult to find a rule when you need it. And the game is easily broken with certain gangs, equipment, or tactics cards. But you know what? The game is filled to the brim with rich character. 
It's like you're playing an RPG war game hybrid. Lazarus died in an act of religious murder-suicide using an article of faith called, and by the manner of his death did the emperor judge him. And it didn't even scratch the enemies he was trying to hurt. He walked up, blew up, and it did literally nothing. He then acquired a trait called fearsome for his scars that makes him harder to interact with in the game. This kind of stuff doesn't happen in a normal war game. This is special. I care about all my little individual dudes, which is why I am not only making an exception to carve up fully painted minis, but I want to. I want everyone to have the correct gear and be highly unique and craft epic gaming moments. When there's a narrative behind the experience, everything is so much more meaningful and memorable. Typically, I hate it when a game has you do an upkeep phase because it just takes so long and I'm here to play the actual game, you know, roll some dice and kill some people, not buy corn for my villagers. But in Necromunda, I genuinely look forward to this sometimes more than playing the actual game. I actually make strategically worse choices in game so I can potentially earn more XP so I can pick up that sick new skill, get an extra wound to beef some people up or something else. I can't wait for Abraham, the lowly juvenile, to rise up and become the gang's new leader when Jedediah's luck runs out. I finished this squad and immediately got to play a game of my campaign and both me and my opponent had fully painted gangs and terrain and it was so awesome. Jedediah just keeps racking up the kills. No one can stop this man, which of course only signals to him that the Emperor is truly blessing his path. I've always wanted to make an individualistic war band for a game and I finally did it. And now I just want to do it again, but with more conversions and kit bashing. This whole process is an awesome hobby experience. And if you have the right group of friends who want to forge a story with you, as opposed to min-maxing you into an early dice-laden grave, I really can't recommend a Dominion campaign for Necromunda more. The epic terrain you're seeing in these shots is from the arbitrator of my campaign or the person running it, John. He also played in my AOS campaign and has a deep love for this game, which is how this game is kept alive. The community surrounding this game makes it so much more accessible. Big love to websites like Necrovox for creating a searchable index for all of the game's terms, or to Yak Tribe for creating a tool that tracks the history of your gang's growth, or Goonhammer for their Necromunda articles explaining what weapons are good and what ones aren't. These people are a huge reason why this game is still popular today, which is a true of a lot of GW specialist games. I hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed crafting this gang. I can't stop looking at them and making dumb sci-fi sounds. It brings me so much happiness. What also brings me so much happiness is all of the amazing patrons who fund these kinds of videos, making it possible for me to take too long on painting and making a video about my Necromunda gang. I am truly indebted to these people. And if you want to support future videos like this, consider checking out my Patreon down below. You get access to things like a Discord server. You get to see weekly behind the scenes posts of what I got going on. You get to see extra painting footage for my videos and more. That's gonna do it for this video, guys. As a reminder, I got a bunch of new stuff on the web store. Those new Wood Elves, Masterclass Courses, Brush Coffin, cheap merchandise that is on clearance right now. And if you are a game store owner or an employee and you have an interest in stocking my product at your store, get in contact with me and let's make that happen. Subscribe or die! And most importantly, don't forget to paint my minis!